Gracious God, we thank you for bringing us together this morning to consider our lives in your work in this world. Help us to be guided always by your light and love that we may know your presence within us and surrounding us today and always. Amen. Our speaker today for this Dean's Forum, I'm very glad to introduce, um, know him quite well. This is my father, Dr. Ron Large. <laughs> uh, Ron is a professor of religious studies at Gonzaga University. His area of uh, expertise is Christian ethics and morality with an emphasis on justice and peace studies, in particular uh, focusing on Gandhi and King. So I'm sure we'll get around to their theology <laughs> quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, my dad has been Teacher of the Year a couple of times at Gonzaga and is wrapping up, what, 35 years at GU, uh, which is a wonderful, obviously I'm not biased at all, fantastic Jesuit institution over in uh, Eastern Washington, a uh, small school for those of you who haven't already heard me mention Gonzaga in my sermons. Uh, and with that, I'd also like to welcome folks who are joining us online, uh, folks who are live streaming. And don't forget, if you want to catch this later as well or listen to something, perhaps hear it again, it will be up on the St. John's YouTube page. Just go to the live section and you'll be able to see anything that we have live streamed. So with that, um, our topic for today is talking about Christian ethics for our modern world. That's a big topic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we are, we'll, we'll solve it all here <clears throat> in about 40 minutes. So All of the, our questions about morality, don't worry, we'll, we'll figure it out. <laughs> so let's start, I think a good place to start is looking at uh, sources for ethics and morality. What are yeah. some of the places that we go to as Christians? Yeah, well, uh, I, I can give you a lot of, I, I feel like I should be doing a stand-up, <laughs> you know, I shouldn't wonder. But, um, yeah, the, the kind of formal answer to, to Amy's question is uh, when we think about sources for Christian morality, typically within the sort of the tradition that we think about so five, four or five areas. So there's scripture, obviously, tradition, reason, and experience. So all of those really kind of frame the way we think about how we make moral decisions or try to figure out what's the right thing to do, which is in some respects basically what ethics is all about. So how do we know what the right thing is? How do we figure that out? How do we do it? And how do we justify that? So there's lots of ways in which those claims can be made. Just, uh, just to give you an example, this, my students know this. I go off on tangents a bit, but eventually we, we come back to where we're supposed to be. So uh, ethics in, in a broad way is thinking about um, essential principles or guidelines that we then use to think about what it is we're going to do when we're asked to make a decision. And not all decisions are moral decisions, so that should be pretty obvious. So, I mean, they could be, but I'll just give you kind of a trivial example. I'm going to eat cereal or yogurt for breakfast. It's not technically a moral issue, okay? But in general, what happens is you have sort of a basic guiding principle, and the easiest way to explain that is probably through utilitarianism, because they have a nice little pithy sort of uh, guiding statement. Anybody know what, what that is in utilitarianism? If you want to know what the right thing to do is, it's the greatest good for the greatest number. Okay? So if you're contemplating choices, which is what ethics really is about, Aristotle says this, ethics is about that which can be other. So we're, we're asked to make a choice. So you would look at those choices and say, okay, if I do this, will that bring about the greatest good for the greatest number? If I do this, will that bring about the greatest good for the greatest number? And then once you make that decision, then that's the right one. That's a bit oversimplified, but that's the basic idea. Uh, other ethical theories sort of have the same process. So um, another one might be do that which makes you happy. Okay. Well, will this one do it or will that one do it? Or what is my duty? What is my obligation? And then, then I'll do that. Okay. So in Christian ethics, that's part of the conversation that we all engage in. I mean, what is that basic guiding principle or norm that we would then use when we're confronted with a decision or an action that we need to take? What would be the right one to do? Okay. 
So within that context, then, in Christianity and Christian ethics, we talk about those four sources. So scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. And they all play a role in kind of framing our discussion and our conversation about what is it that we ought to do? And how do we know what the right answer is? The problem is that uh, there's no universal agreement on this. Okay? So even within the Christian tradition, as you all know, there's various ways in which people think about what is the right thing to do. Okay? And what do we rely on in order to do that? Okay? Some people, it's, the emphasis is almost entirely on Scripture. Some it might be that what the tradition is taught. Uh, others might think about sort of, okay, what's reasonable here? But how does that coincide or correlate to my own experience? And then thinking about that in terms of making, making decisions. So that's sort of a broad sweeping perspective on how we might think about what it is that we want to do when we're asked to make choices. So I don't know, Amy, you, you might follow up on that. Yeah, that's really helpful. And I think that one of the nice ways of, of understanding this is, is that it, it's very complex. And especially for our world today, Jesus did not speak explicitly to a high technological globalized economy. And so we have to extrapolate from yeah. those sources, as you said, based on our experience, yeah. what will be the right thing. Yeah, so I'll give you a kind of an example of this. Uh, as Amy mentioned, I did my doctoral dissertation on Martin Luther King and uh, Gandhi. And for Martin, uh, the, the, the night before he's killed, um, which would have been April 3rd, 1968, he's given what's called the mountaintop speech that you're all probably familiar with. And in the speech, he talks about uh, the threats that are out there against, against him. And he says, I'm not, I'm not worried about that now. I'm not fearing anybody. I just want to do God's will. So for King, that was sort of his guiding principle. I just want to do God's will. Now, the question is, of course, how do we know what that is? You know? But that's the basic idea. And so he then finishes that part of the speech when he says, uh, um, you know, God's allowed me to go up and I've been to the mountaintop and I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know that tonight we as a people will get to the promised land. It's a great moment. But within that, it's his question, how do I answer that question? You know, I just want to do God's will. So for King, and, 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 and this is, you know, significant for me in terms of the way I think about it. For Martin, it was a sense of discipleship. So ethics for him is what does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to be a disciple? What does that look like? What is the claim that's being made on us? And ethics is about that. You know, what's the claim that's being made on us in light of that basic understanding of how do we know what the right thing to do is? I just want to do God's will, okay? So if you ask King that question, how do you know what that is, his guiding frame of reference would be discipleship. So how do we follow that? What's the claim that Jesus is making on us? And uh, for him, of course, which I can talk about King all day long if you'd like, um, but for King, it was essentially uh, the building the beloved community. Okay, that's, that's what it means to do God's will. So if you're contemplating an action or deciding what the right thing to do is, the answer to the question would be, is this going to build the beloved community or not? Okay. And he has ideas about what that looks like. Okay. So justice, uh, inclusion, you know, those sorts of concepts. And then if, if what you're contemplating doing will lead to that, then that's the right thing to do. If it doesn't, it's either you're either missing something or it's not what you should be doing. Okay. So for, for him, as I said, kind of as a specific example would be the way in which we think about the answer to that question. How do I know whether I'm doing God's will? <clears throat> and there's a very practical application for that for King, the building the beloved community. So. And also where King really understood and what I think is, is very helpful too is that anything that you are doing along the way to build beloved community has to, in and of itself, also be a moral participation. Yeah. So um, I'll I just give you kind of a couple of examples of this. 
Uh, one, one of King's favorite uh, phrases was, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Uh, we, you know, it, he quotes that all the time. So for, for King, and God's creation is not simply just a physical reality, it's a moral reality. Okay? And that creation has a moral structure to it. And that structure is grounded in justice. So if what you are doing is contributing to that moral arc, okay, then again, that's, that's the right thing to do. And so it, it's a way of contemplating in practice how we think about, um, do, as I said a little while ago, doing God's will. How do we understand what it means to be created in God's image? And then how do we live that out in, in reality? So for, for King, uh, w one way to think about it is that it, to be created in God's image means that we all share a basic human unity. Okay? And that's also defined by the presence of dignity and justice. So if you deny people their dignity, you're violating God's cre creation, basically. If you deny justice, you're denying creation. So that's why for him, the moral concept that surrounds creation was probably more important than the sort of the, just the physical reality of, you know, we live in, in, in the created world. Okay? So um, it's important to think of that as sort of a moral s substructure for, for King. You know, I haven't said much about Gandhi. Gandhi's kind of the same way uh, in terms of building unity and, and oneness. Uh, so in inclusivity. Uh, one of the things that he was, Gandhi was really concerned about and which he really couldn't resolve was the split and the conflict between the Hindus and Muslims when independence came. And if you know about that, the great movements and a lot of people were killed. Uh, he went on a hunger strike, fast under the death, uh, to stop it. Okay. So th this idea of building community, the beloved community that's inclusive, was really important for both of them. So when you think about what the right thing to do is, that's what you need to ask yourself. Is what I'm contemplating bringing that about or not? Okay. And that's based, that's how they took it. But you're saying that that is deeply grounded in our spiritual reality, regardless of Dr. King and Gandhi speaking to this. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, uh, 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 King helps me think about this in a more practical, focused way. But if you think about sort of creation theology that we often talk about now, uh, what does it mean to care for the created world? I mean, it's, it's us as people, but it's also the world around us as well. So I'll give you just kind of an example. So for King, there were three basic, um, I guess you could call them evils. So one was obviously racism, uh, and poverty was another, and violence was another. And I'm going to speculate here, but he might be willing to add climate issues t today to that reality of what we're confronted with and how we need to think about our lives together in that context. So p partly it's a way in which he would sort of see the world around him and, and in light of his own theological understanding of creation, humanity, what it means to live together in the beloved community, and what are the things that prevent that. And those, the four areas that I mentioned, the three of his and the, the next one, would, would reflect that. So um, he tries to figure out a way to, in some sense, confront all of those. And I, I think partly, um, I'll give, give you another example of this. One of the things that King talks about is the way in which we, um, well, uh, he, he was interested in what, what we might, I don't know if he uses terminology or not, sort of a moral economy, a moral economic system where people aren't necessarily, or not at all, o oppressed as a, as a consequence of where they are within that. So King had a lot of practical ideas. So he, he often, in his letter from the Birmingham jail, for example, he talks about uh, a, gu a guaranteed income that people would have. Um, Universal health care. Yeah, yeah, things like that. So what is it that we need to flourish? You know, so health care, education, income. And those are the things that we need to build our policies around. Okay? And so for him, everything had this sort of moral context in relationship to where we are in terms of building that community. And I think it's really helpful, too, to understand that, that again, just how complex this is, and so that it's not that 
one of us, even Dr. King on him, by himself, could not get us to that, you know, kind of perfect place. And that, I think, can be really difficult for folks as they assume, if I can't make a significant difference, why bother trying? Yeah, you know, Martin has a great, um, uh, I think it's called the drum major instinct, is one of his speeches, uh, sermons actually. And, and he talks about, um, you know, be, being a leader and, and what that means. But he also talks about, there's a, a nice phrase the Jesuits like, uh, servant leadership. Okay? You know, you're all probably familiar with that concept. And that's sort of the way in which he frames this. So no matter what you are, or what you're doing, you can make a contribution. So there's a line in the drum major instinct where he says something like, if your job is to sweep the floors, do the best job that you can. Be you a know. drum major for sweeping. Be, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, but he does talk about being a drum major for justice. Yeah, that's kind of where this is all going. But we can all participate in that. So, it, it, in, uh, again, I'll give you another example. If you look at the letter from the Birmingham jail, uh, he talks about why he's in Birmingham. And I won't give you a whole lecture on the letter, but it's basically a series of escalating justifications of why he's in Birmingham until you get to the point of the justification of civil disobedience. Okay. But uh, in the opening passages of the letter, he says, well, I, I'm in, I've been invited here, but I'm also here because injustice is here. And, he t and there's a great line that he's often, uh, one of his most quoted lines, he says, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Whatever affects one directly affects others indirectly. And he, he loves to use this phrase, you know, no one is an island. You know, we're all interrelated, all interconnected, tied together in a single garment of destiny. Okay. It's in the first couple paragraphs of the letter to Birmingham jail. And so it's a way in which we think about ourselves as participants within this process. Even though on an individual level, we might think that, I, I, you know, what is it that, that I can do? I can't, I can't solve this. I, I can't fix this. It just seems too overwhelming to me. But if you think about it in a broader context, uh, in terms of building that community, then, yeah, there are strategies and ways in which we can do that. And so for King, countering those evils, so you counter violence with nonviolence, okay? You counter poverty with economic justice. Years ago, I'm gonna digress for a minute. Uh, years ago, the US Catholic bishops wrote a pastoral letter called Economic Justice for All, okay? In which they talk about economic justice. And then, of course, combating racism, okay? So a lot of the things that he was talking about are the ways in which we uh, try to address those, you know, a as a movement. And neither Gandhi nor King were naive enough to believe that this would happen o overnight. Uh, I mean, they talk about this for the long haul. But at the same time, they also need to give people hope. Um, in the dream speech, um, the dream speech is a series of uh, call and response refrains, basically. So he opens up the dream speech about, I'm, I'm glad to be here and you know, 100 years. And then he says things like, well, we're 100 years later, we're still not free. 100 years later. And then he says, well, uh, people ask me, when will you be satisfied? And he goes, we will never be satisfied until. We will never be satisfied until. And then, he's, then the question is like, well, how long is this gonna take? He goes, how long, not long? How long, not long, okay? And, but what guides us that? And he says, well, our faith will guide us. He says, with this faith, we can do this. With this faith, we can do this. And one of the, my favorite images from, from King is that he says, with this faith, we will be able to hew out of a mountain of despair, a stone of hope. I mean, just think of that visually. I mean, the mountain's all around us, right? Well, maybe not to the east, but. Okay. Uh, think about that image visually, a mountain of despair. And we're going to pull out of that a stone of hope. You can hold it in your hand. But that's enough. You know, that's what we need. And then, of course, he goes on to the dream sequence. I have a dream that one day. I have a dream that one day. And then he ends the dream speech with the let freedom ring sequence. So it, it builds off of these call and response refrains. There's about five or six of them throughout the entire the dream speech. And the last one, of course, is, uh, you know, let freedom ring, let freedom ring, let freedom ring. And when we let it ring, we'll be able to, 
sing in the words of the old words of the old Negro spiritual free at last free at last thank God Almighty we are free at last and actually another digression that's what's on uh, Martin's grave that quote free at last free at last thank God Almighty I'm free at last it's a it's a great moment so anyway sorry Amy, you no, probably no, have another question good. <laughs> well I think that one of the things that's important again that you're pointing us to is and I preached about this a you know a couple of months ago is that maladjustment that we have to have to the world as it is because as soon as we become okay with oppression as soon as we become satisfied with inequality as soon as we become passive to injustice, then we are not living our moral lives doing God's will and seeking right. to be disciples of Christ. We have let the powers and principalities of this world yeah. condemn us to that mountain of despair. Yeah. You know, um, Amy probably read the letter from Birmingham jail. Uh, In fact, just on Monday, I read it. <laughs> Uh, there is a section in there where he talks about uh, not being adjusted and being maladjusted. He talks about Jesus being maladjusted to the things that are around him. And um, in the letter, um, King is accused of being an extremist. And he says, at first that really bothered me. And then I thought, you know, well, you know, Jesus was an extremist. So why can't I be one? And then he says, yeah, but there's a second question to that idea. Is it what kind of extremist will you be? Are you going to be an extremist for hate? Or are you going to be an extremist for love? Make your choice. You know, which one builds the beloved community? And of course, the answer to King is obvious, you know. But yeah, this idea of being, it's a great uh, word, maladjusted. Yeah, we should always be, you know, maladjusted. Um, and it's an ongoing process. So, you know, one of King's favorite Bible passages is uh, from Amos. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. And that's part of it when he says we will never be satisfied until this happens. Okay. Uh, another quick digression. If you go to Montgomery, uh, the Civil Rights Memorial that's there, has anyone ever been seen it at all? The same, it was designed by the same young woman that did the Vietnam Memorial, uh, Maya Lin. And... Um, it's visually, it's stunning. D Google it. L look at this picture. The Civil Rights Memorial in Montgomery. It's, it's basically uh, a wall. I mean, it's not as tall as this, but uh, it's a wall, and then water flows down over top of it, uh, and it comes into this sort of channel, and then it comes up through a, a, a cone, an inverted cone. The point is, it, it's like an ice cream cone. So the point is at the bottom, and the water comes up through the center of the cone, runs over the top, and then down the sides. And around the cone are the names of all the people that were killed in the Civil Rights Movement. And on the wall, though, where the water's coming down, is that quote from Amos. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. It's, it's a brilliant uh, combination of sort of language and the, and the visual image uh, that I think, you know, Martin really would appreciate, you know, so... That is really pretty. And I think it's important to have the art that can continue to pull us into, you know, thinking about things in a dynamic way. Well, you know, uh, you know one of the things about ethics, uh, it, it, you also have to pay attention to the words you use. I mean, in, in many respects, I'm becoming more and more convinced. I don't, I, I don't know. As I, I get older, I don't know. <laughs> what does this mean? You know, um, that the words that we use create the reality that surrounds us or the stories that we tell are the reality in which we live. And so the question is, are your stories truthful or untruthful? Okay. Uh, how are our words shaping the reality around us as we think about this? Yeah. I, I'll give you really uh, another example from King. Uh, for a while, in the beginning of the Montgomery bus boycott, which, which starts with Rosa Parks' arrest on December 1st, 1955, uh, a little quick historical note here. So they were deciding what to do in response to her arrest. And the decision was made, well, we'll, we'll, we'll have a boycott. We'll boycott the buses. Uh, one day, Monday, December 5th. Okay. And so they, they spent the next few days mimeographing flyers, putting them all around town, you know, boycott the buses on Monday, try to get a ride to work or whatever, whatever. Um, and so, uh, as you know, the, that Monday, it, they were really kind of shocked at how successful the boycott was. So they had a meeting that night at the Holt Street Baptist Church 
which was Ralph Abernathy's church. Martin's church was the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. So that night, uh, just almost like, wow, what do we do now? Uh, they decided to continue the boycott. So they had to organize, I mean, it's $5,000 a month to run the boycott in 1955. That's a lot of money, okay? R raising money, coordinating, carpools, all, all kinds of things. Oh, another quick digression. There's a great movie about this. It's called The Long Walk Home with Whoopi Goldberg and Sissy Spacek. It's a fabulous film. Uh, King is in it only sort of, as a, and as a side, you hear his voice periodically, but it's about the relationship between the two women. It's really a great film. I, I highly recommend it. came out in 92, I think. I highly recommend it. So, here, okay, here's where all this is going. In the early days of the boycott, Martin uses the phrase passive resistance. Okay. We're going to use passive resistance. Well, if you think about that, it sounds pretty anemic. Sounds like a doormat. Yeah, well, kind of, <laughs> yes. We're going to engage in passive resistance. Well, pretty soon they figure out, well, that's, that's, not, that's not what we want to say. So they talk about nonviolent action. And a little later on, even in the letter from Birmingham jail, he talks about direct action and even civil disobedience. You know? So it's important to think about how we are expressing ourselves in relationship to what it is we actually think we're trying to do, we're trying to accomplish. You know? G Gandhi struggles with this as well. So both of them really were conscious of how their language was shaping the reality around them and how that would affect the people that were listening to them. You know? So as you, as you think about that, I mean, that's a lot of conversation that's going on today about what, what, what our language means, how we use it, uh, how people hear what we are saying and trying to be conscious of that. I mean, it's not, it's not easy to do. I mean, I'm in class sometimes, and I'm thinking, hmm, do I really want to say that? You know? <laughs> or what would happen if I said this? Um, sometimes I can prep the students you know, well enough that when I say something, uh, oh yeah, now I see what he means, you know, or something like that. But yeah, I, I, think about, I think about that a lot, probably a lot more than I did when I started teaching, I don't know, 40 some years ago. You know, um, so the words that we use are also important, and that's why King, I think, um, I, I mean, you can read his things, but you really have to hear them. I mean, the the the, the speeches, the sermons. Um, yeah. Anyway, I caught off on a tangent there. I mean, if you had another question. No, I think that's a really important point. Is that the word, the words that we use, and I, I would even go so far as to say the way that our thoughts are constructing the words that we're using, and then how are we able to be mindful of that in a way that allows us to be thoughtful of the words that we are using and to continue in that ongoing reflection. Because as you say, it is complex. You do need to adjust. King and Gandhi both adjusted their language. They adjusted their tactics. They adjusted their stances on things. And they were very purposeful about what they were engaging with. So that way there was a clear vision of what they were striving for who and who they were working against and what they were going towards. And, and I think that you know, as you said, it's, it, is, it is really hard. All of this is really hard. And in many ways, I think that for us today, that's part of why ethics can seem so overwhelming is because often there's kind of an assumption of like, I have to be completely good, that totally saintly person who, you know, doesn't eat any meat and drives electric cars, or I, <laughs> uh, you know, drive a gas and gasoline car and eat a lot of beef. And, and that there's somehow not a gray area. And that's when I think it's very easy for us to get trapped in cyclical thinking of what difference can I actually make? And as soon as we give in to that despair of I don't make a difference, then, you know, we really run the risk of not leaving a life of discipleship. Yeah, let, let me give you, uh, I've I talked about King a lot. Let me give you another example from Gandhi. Uh, one of the things he struggled against, as you know, if you read him, is the caste system. Oh, there's a great book, by the way, uh, Caste, Elizabeth Wilkerson. If you haven't read it, you should read it. It's, it's amazing. The other really interesting book that I, uh, it's been out a couple years now by uh, Ibram Kendry, The Stamp from the Beginning. Uh, you probably maybe know his uh, other books, more recent ones, How to Raise an Anti-Racist Baby. I think that's the title or something like that. But uh, uh, King, in terms of the untouchability, he, he, now there was Gandhi. some... Oh, sorry, yeah, sorry. 
<laughs> well, uh, yeah. King does go to India in 1959, okay? And he meets a lot of the people that worked with uh, Gandhi at the time, so it's easy to get them confused. But anyway, there's a, oh, there's a great picture I show my students uh, of King, and he's reading a book, and, it's, and the book, title of the book is The Gandhi Reader. And uh, on the desk in front of him is the Bible. So two, two books that he really liked a lot. So anyway, let me tell you where this is going. Um, King uses the term Harijan, which means children of God, to talk about the untouchables. Now, it was pretty controversial because some of them liked that and some of them didn't. Um, but he, he realized that uh, as long as we sort of pigeonhole people or put them in their place, um, you know, we just had to figure out a way to break out of that. Okay. Um, so the other thing, let me mention another thing, sort of, uh, in, in thinking about ethics, it's also related to our, sort of, our own um, self-perception. Uh, and I kind of said this a little while ago about the stories that we tell about ourselves to define who we are. So one of the things, certainly for Gandhi, and I think for King too, they talk about being humble and humility. Um, Gandhi talks about reducing the self to zero is a phrase that he uses, being like a drop in the ocean. You know, you can't really tell where that drop is because it's just part of the bigger concept and process. And part of that, I think, was the recognition that, kind of as Amy was hinting at, yeah, this is hard and we don't have all the answers. Okay. Um, but there's a way to struggle through that. And I'll, I'll, just quickly, I'll give you Gandhi's theory of conflict resolution. Okay. So his idea was that, well, one, let me back up again even further. One of the problems that we face in terms of ethics is absolutism. Okay, I have the absolute truth, and by golly, I'm going to make you see it if I have to kill you for it. You know? Okay. Well, Gandhi believed that we don't, we don't have that. We might think we do, but we don't. And so his idea was that, and this is why nonviolence was so important for him. Ahimsa means non-harm or non-injury. Um, the idea was if you're in a situation of conflict or thinking about making a decision, you have to look at, yeah, what are the perspectives that other people bring to that? And for, for Gandhi, his, his nice phrase was, it's the title of his uh, autobiography, The Story of My Experiments with Truth. So how do we find the truth in any given situation? Well, the way in which he thought about that was that you have to understand that if you do not have the absolute truth, that means other people do not either, but they have partial visions of the truth. So how do we find those? How do we look for those? And then we try to figure out a way, in some sense, to create a new solution out of those truths, recognizing that none of them are absolute, because as I said, that's what drives a lot of violence, is the perception that we have, you know, the absolute truth, and we're going to make sure you get it, you know. So partly their understanding of being human and being humble and cultivating humility was on that basis. It doesn't mean you're weak or it doesn't mean you're passive. It doesn't mean you're a doormat. Uh, it means you recognize that you do not have the absolute truth and you need to recognize that truth exists in other people as well. And sort of building the beloved community, to go back to sort of a king image, is is that's part of the process which you might want to think about how that gets done or how, how you do that okay and certainly the idea that um, interrelationship Thich Nhat Hanh talks about interbeing and of course Thich Nhat Hanh and Dr. King worked together yeah. in anti-Vietnam war work um, but that interbeing and that recognizing me as, as I exist as Amy only exists because of the relationships and the relational reality that I'm a part of yeah, I mean, I'll go back to King's uh, uh, line in the Birmingham jail. You know, we, we don't exist as isolated individuals. You know, we're all connected together. And so we have to act in such a way that sustains that, you know, and, and, and realize that. Even, even the enemy, I mean, um, you know, I think this is really, I think for me, one of the hardest things to think about doing and dealing with is how do you treat the enemy in such a way that they can realize this as well? I, I honestly do not have an answer to that. <laughs> you know? uh, partly it's situational, but partly it's just having the, uh, I don't know another word to use, sort of just the fortitude to, to try to do that. I mean... 
I, I, you know, I mean, as I said, <laughs> you know, partly too, you think about Gandhi and King and you go, wow, well, those guys were like, wow, they were way up there. We could never be like that. But yet at the same time, you know, yeah, there's a struggle there internal that you strive to think about how to create that yourself. So, you know, mindfulness, thinking about our language, thinking about the narrative or the stories that we tell about ourselves and how that ties into the narrative and the stories that other people have as well. And that creates the reality that, you know, surrounds us. So um, I, had some, I had some other thoughts. They'll come back to my head in a minute. Well, and that's also why it's so important to have that inner strength. And so for both Gandhi and King, and certainly within our tradition, we do talk so much about prayer and the, the personal work that needs to happen in order to be able to have the strength to face those who are opposing us, to face ideas that might be oppressing us. That's very important. Yeah, I mean, Martin uh, talks a lot about his, uh, his, his prayer life, you know, what that looks like. Uh, and there's all this need for that space for yourself. Um, uh, Gandhi, uh, what Gandhi would often do is kind of interesting in a way. He, he would found these little communities, ashrams, and they were sort of a refuge or retreat place. Now, you know, work was being done there because they were basically kind of nonviolent training centers, essentially, you know. Uh, you know, how do, how do we do this? You know, what are the things that we need to do? Uh, and, you know, the vow, Gandhi was very big on taking vows. So the vow of non-possession, non-attachment. So things don't control you. You know, you don't give in to those things. You know, you can then act. And so this, and uh, the, one of the funniest lines, at least I think it's kind of funny, a Gandhi line, uh, some of his companions, uh, you know, cost a lot of I've mentioned the bus boycott, cost a lot of money to do these things. Okay, build the ashrams, you know. Or organized demonstrations, and so and Gandhi has this vow of poverty, and so one of his uh, I, I'm not sure apocryphal which one of his co-workers said is if Gandhi only knew what it cost us to keep him in poverty, <laughs> you know, um, and yeah that that struggle so it you know it's very practical it's financial as well I mean there's lots of things that you know kind of go into this and King. Once he became sort of the focal point for the movement, for better or worse, and he struggled with that, because obviously he wasn't the only person in the movement. Lots of people did lots of things. But part of his job was fund, you know, basic fundraising. I mean, he would go to a college campus or a town, give a speech, pass the collection plate, you know, and uh, m money for the movement. Uh, when he won the Nobel Peace Prize, um, he gave the money to the movement. Uh, a quick story about Gandhi. Uh, Gandhi's in South Africa um, because he couldn't find work in India. <laughs> he was a, trained as a lawyer. Um, uh, but uh, he's in South Africa and then he's going back uh, to India and as a parting gift, um, they're given gifts, he and his, his family. He, he refuses to accept them because what he was doing was ser public service. And he, I shouldn't be rewarded for that. Was, and this caused a lot of dissension within his family as well. You know? So uh, f I think for both of them, you know, that, that struggle was both external in terms of what do we need to do, and yet both internal. How do we maintain ourselves in such a way that we can continue to do this? You know? And it's, it's really, it's, it's difficult at times. Uh, I do want to be mindful of the time and open us up for some questions. Uh, Pete's going to come around with the microphone, so if you do have a question. Yeah. What do you do with your Christian ethics in the case of war? Sorry, I missed that. What do you do with your Christian ethics in the case of war when, oh, you're, yeah, when you're at yeah, war? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, <laughs> this is very interesting. A number of years ago at Gonzaga, um, we have what's called the Socratic Club. And a number of years ago, and they discussed questions. And one of them was, uh, should Christians be pacifist? Okay. And uh, I was one of the speakers or respondents to that question. 
So the, the board, they had a big projector and an overhead, big question, can Christians be pacifists? And I just turned to it and said, yes, <laughs> okay. Uh, which was a little bit facetious. I just kind of want to see what was going on. You know, I, I kind of, uh, I know you asked in a Christian context. Let me give you sort of Gandhi's response in a way, and then I'll unpack that a bit more. Um, when World War I breaks out, um, Gandhi organizes an ambulance corps. So his question was that, you know, I, I, I didn't start this. I can't end it. What can I do to alleviate the suffering? Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start an ambulance corps. Right? Now, in World War II, it was a little different for him. Uh, he started what was called the Quit India Movement to get the British out, quit India. He was arrested and put in jail for about two years until the war was over, you know, because they didn't want Gandhi running around India, you know, organizing to push the British out while the war's going on. But at the same time, uh, you know, th thinking about that, and I've struggled with this a long, long time. You know, one of the best thinkers in my mind about this is a guy named Stanley Hauerwas. Uh, Stanley, H-A-U-E-R-W-A-S. Uh, Stanley has written a number of books on war and peace and pacifism and Christianity. He's really, I think, one of the key figures in thinking about your question about war and violence and pacifism. But I think for me, here's the thing. You know, a war starts... Uh, and somebody will say to a pacifist, well, gee, look, look at where you got. I mean, how are you going to fix this? And the response is, well, wait a minute. What are you asking me to do here? <laughs> I mean, what I want to try to do is alleviate as much suffering as I can. Can I stop this war? Probably not. Could I have prevented it? Maybe not. But given that reality, how do I deal with that as it is? You know? So yeah, I think, you know, Martin, when he comes out again, he gives his speech on uh, April 4th, 1967, a year to the day before he's killed in Riverside Church in New York City, why, why I'm against the war in Vietnam. And he talks about just the level of violence that it, it creates. And so the idea was that the war itself is bringing about more harm than any good it could ever hope to bring about, you know. But he couldn't end it, you know, him, himself, you know. Um, the other thing that he talks about is uh, uh, in the speech against the war in Vietnam, it goes by many titles. Mostly it goes by a title called Beyond Silence. Um, and he says, I can't keep silent anymore. I have to speak out. And he talks about toward the end of that uh, sermon uh, of being on the right side of history and a transvaluation of values. We, that's what we need to bring about. So if you look at sort of a, where I started a while back here and almost an hour ago, thinking about those, what King calls the three evils. Yeah, violence, war, uh, racism, poverty, you know. So, I mean, I don't, I don't have a good answer to that question, but I think the way I would, I would approach that is basically from Gandhi's saying, what is it that I can do in this situation that's going to help to alleviate suffering? Whether that's, um, you know, whatever that might look like, you know, participating in something or helping people in some way. Uh, here's another interesting thing about violence and nonviolence. Now I'll, I'll give you time to ask another question. Um, there's, there's a double standard that's often at work here. It goes something like this. If you're in a situation, I don't mean you personally, but in a situation and violence is used and it doesn't get the result that's wanted, what is the assumption that's often made? What do you need to do next? You need to use more violence. You didn't use enough of it. Okay. If you use nonviolence in a situation and it doesn't work, what's often the assumption? Nonviolence doesn't work. Use violence. You never say to yourself, I guess I wasn't nonviolent enough. What does that even mean? You know, but that's the double standard that we often, the trap in some sense that we fall into thinking about that. So anyway, I'll... I just want to add a little bit to that. I had the wonderful privilege of actually being in one of my dad's classes. It's the most popular class at Gonzaga. It's the Vietnam War and Christian Morality. 
And the way that he lays it out is the first third of the class is to look at codes of ethics. So what does scripture talk about with regards to war? What does just war theory look like? Historically, how have we looked at issues of war and violence? And then the next part of the class, we read a book called um, A Rumor of War um, by a gentleman who was one of the first Marines, American Marines, who went into Vietnam. And so he writes about his firsthand experience of being in Vietnam. And then the next part of the class, we read a book called When Heaven and Earth Change Places by a South Vietnamese woman. So we get a woman Vietnamese perspective of how that war went. And then the final paper, you have to say, was this war justified? Based on any of the theories that we looked at, based on the firsthand experiences of people in different groups, and then you have to make that decision for yourself. There's, it's no right or wrong answer, you just have to do it. And it, so, you know, it, it is a very complex way of looking at it. And so what I appreciate about your answer is that there's, you know, so often the, the response is there has to be one right answer. But what you're saying is like, look at this moment and what is happening in, in this particular space for me as an individual that I can say something and that I can act in a certain way. Let me add just quickly that, yeah, I didn't say anything about just war theory in terms of the answer to your question. Yeah, there's a whole tradition of just war theory. So there's what's called uh, justice before the war, use ad bellum, justice in the war, use in bello. So the things you want to know before you can go to war can consider just in the way in which wars are fought. So there is a moral framework that surrounds this. Now, it's easily abused, of course, as you all know. But the basic idea behind just war theory is you had to contain the amount of violence that takes place in war. Now, a, a pacifist would argue that's just basically kind of a nonsense statement. But nonetheless, y there, is, there has been a long, long tradition to think about warfare and ethics and how do we limit the amount of destruction that takes place in war. So one of the key concepts in just war theory is called proportionality. And the idea there is, is the amount of violence that's taking place proportional to the outcome that you want. And if it becomes out of balance, this was King's argument, then the war becomes unjust. The US Catholic bishops uh, also wrote a statement years ago called the challenge of peace. And it's a lot about just war theory within the Catholic tradition. Uh, and how they would try to apply it, particularly this is in the relationship with, with uh, nuclear weapons, but it's also been applied to particular wars as well. So that's another way in which that has, has attempted to be answered. So, are there other questions? Um, we've been talking over the last couple of weeks about kind of the landscape of American Christianity, the progressive movement, um, and how that differs from you know, Christianity that's more on the right in the last few decades, um, and what the reasons might be for the progressive movement being not quite as powerful or organized. Um, and one of the reasons that has been offered is that folks on the left tend to be a bit mistrustful of institutions, um, which definitely rings true with me. Um, and I think another reason for me, uh, for my kind of hesitancy and being involved in kind of um, mission building or um, participation in large kind of group efforts um, within the Christian left is, you know, my attraction to Jesus as a meek person who was kind of always running away from attention and telling people not to tell the authorities what he was up to. So I was wondering if you have any insight from King's life as to how he kind of thought about you know, how to reconcile Jesus as like a very quiet leader with what he was trying to do. Yeah, well, you know, um, you know, Martin, I, I, I keep calling him Martin. I've studied King for 45 years, so it's like, I just say Dr. King. Um, yeah, I mean, again, it's that sense of what is it that you can do, and, and not necessarily in comparison to other people, people that are doing similar things, but where can you make a contribution, you know, and, and what might that look like? It might be, well, I'll give you, give you some examples of this. In the Montgomery bus boycott, uh, mailings, people were volunteered to stuff envelopes. I mean, it was all kinds of things that would contribute to the movement, even though you might think, or a person might think, you know, well, putting this note in this envelope, I don't know, what's that going to fix? 
But at the same time, without that, it, it wouldn't have happened. So partly it's a way of recognizing where you can make your contribution, not so much in terms of, wow, this person is really doing a whole lot. I, I can't, I, you know, I, I can't compete with that, you know. Um, so I, I think it's more just, you know, in your own practice, what is it that you can contribute? And yeah, I, and you know, partly, I'll, I'll be the first to admit this. I mean, in, in many respects, and a lot of times in the movement, there's a lot of fear. You know, there's a, there's a oh, I should mention this too. Uh, there's a great series, probably most of you have seen it, uh, Eyes on the Prize, that public TV did a number of years ago. It's a great documentary history of the civil rights movement. But there's one scene where they're in the church, and there's tear gas outside, uh, the church is being surrounded, and King is there and other people are there and they're going like, wow, how do, we, how do we keep these people alive? And how do we keep them whole? And the, the, in, in terms of just overcoming that fear. Now that's a, that's a bigger example of what you're thinking about. But what they were trying to do was to show people that they didn't need to be afraid. That's what Jesus says, do not be afraid. Yeah, do not be afraid. Yeah, there's a great, oh, I mentioned mention this too, another quick tangent. Uh, I don't know if you know that uh, Dom, Dom Crossan, he's a New Testament scholar. Uh, he's written a, a lot, a lot, a lot of books. The guy's, the guy's a genius. But he, he was given a series of talks over Christmas uh, called The First Christmas. And it was about kind of what that meant. He was looking at um, um, Matthew and, and Luke. And, and one of the things he talked about was uh, sort of the, how we perceive Jesus and how we think about him. And he told the, the parable or the story where they're in the boat. Remember the disciples are in the boat and Jesus is out walking on the water and the storm comes up or something and they're all afraid and they all know like, what to do. And so Crossan said, you know what that story tells us? Keep Jesus in the boat. <laughs> and I thought, wow, what a great image for the church. Keep Jesus in the boat. You know? And the water's calm. You know, it, it, it's metaphorical in the sense of you, you'll never n not experience fear again. But uh, King, King understood this quite readily. Uh, and he talks about uh, the connection between hate and fear. And what we fear, we hate. What we hate, we fear. And so how do we work to overcome that? You know, don't be afraid. Or don't make people afraid of you, you know. Uh, Martin says something like, you know, hate, uh, well, when Martin was doing his PhD in Boston, he uh, was influenced uh, greatly by a theory called personalism, two of his uh, professors. And the, this was the focus on the dignity of the person and how important that was. And hate distorts the personality. Uh, and so the more you hate, the more distorted you become. And the more you get controlled by that. And so partly the idea is to work on a way to overcome. That's kind of a long-winded answer to that question, but I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you know, uh, there's a phrase that King uses. Uh, he says, God is Christ-like. I can't remember where that's from, but that's what he says. Uh, God is, so if you want to know what God is like, God is Christ-like. Now, obviously, he's talking within the context of a Christian tradition. Uh, but that was important for him. As I said a, a while back, Discipleship model is the framework around which King sees his ethics being developed and, and framed. Um, oh, quickly, two, two King resources. The best single volume collection on King is called A Testament of Hope. It's a great collection of speeches, sermons, writings, everything in a single volume. It's pretty big, maybe four or five hundred pages. It's great. The second, well, there's lots of books on King, you, you can probably guess. But the second one that's in process, at Stanford University, there's a Martin Luther King Center for Liberation Curriculum. I think that's the title. They're working to put together a collection of every single thing re related to King, writing, speeches, letters, everything. Supposedly a 13-volume series. They're only halfway through, and they started 20 years ago. Okay. I'm not sure if they're ever going to finish it. Gandhi, just quickly, uh, his collected works, um, each one's about 500 pages, and there's 100 volumes. So, anyway, other questions? We, we, yeah, we, oh, yeah, we got a little bit more time. 
Um, I, I think this will take us back to um, King talking about uh, the war. And as I recall, in the um, uh, one of the volumes of Taylor Branch's uh, trilogy, uh, King, I think, struggled a lot, or at least according to the book, with whether whether and when to be to oppose the Civil War because of Johnson. Yeah. And Johnson was such. I mean, <laughs> the Vietnam, Vietnam War, not War, Civil yeah. War. Sorry. Got it. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but I think for me, when I was reading that, it, it it highlights another struggle we all face in terms of ethics and morality and sort of choosing one's battles, but yeah. also because he he knew going against Johnson would could alienate all of the work Johnson was doing with civil rights. Yeah, I, I think, I, yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, King struggled with this a lot. Uh, what sets it up is really uh, the young people in SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, that was an organization, mostly college-age students. And they were obviously affected and aware in the, in the situation of, of Vietnam. And they were, I don't want to say pressuring, uh, yeah, you could say that, pressuring King to come out against the war. And he was reluctant for just the very reason you stated, that you know, he knew that coming out against the war, at least really forcefully, uh, in a kind of a really public forum, uh, could, would alienate Johnson. Uh, so he was uh, hesitant, but yet it was basically his timing. I mean, uh, I, don't, I don't really blame him for that because there's a whole politics that surrounds this. You know, do you want to get the Civil Rights Act passed? You know? Um, and so, yeah, he struggled with that. But I think, I think the tipping point was Martin began to see himself, certainly after receiving the Nobel Peace Prize, on sort of a world stage. He begins to use the language of a world house, okay? And thinking about his responsibility as a Nobel Peace Prize winner in terms of what that meant for, for him personally and, and what he needed to say and do. So I think once, once he put himself into that context, that was kind of the point at which he made the decision, yeah, I've got to, I've got to come out and say something. Uh, but yeah, he was castigated for it. Uh, if you look at uh, newspaper editorials the next day, they were all, they were blistering in terms of their critique. You know, why are you mixing civil rights and the war? He tried to answer that in the speech, actually. You know, why are you talking about this? And he says, well, I can't segregate my ethics. That's a phrase that he uses, you know. So, Partly it was just the practical reality of the best time, but also I think more his sense of responsibility that he now had on a, on a world stage. And also to address, as, as he said, you know, the, just the level of violence that was you know, taking place. So, yeah. Other, we got about, what, two more minutes. Here, you go ahead and use this one. You get I wondered how you um, would think about Christians thinking about the war in the Ukraine. Yeah. Um, You know, my cynical self says um, we should do everything in the, we can to support the Ukrainians. But what does that mean? You know, what does that look like? I mean, I know there's a lot of discussion now about sending tanks and things like that. Um, you know, um, I mean, how, how, do you, how do we confront basically what amounts to a tragic situation, you know? And I'll just go back to what I said earlier. I mean, what is it we can do to alleviate the suffering? And, and on, on an individual level, maybe that isn't anything. Um, but in terms of thinking about, let me go back to just war theory for a minute. Um, just war theory basically argues, this is an oversimplification, but it basically argues this. Wars of aggression are almost always wrong. If you're the aggressor, you're almost always in the wrong. Now, there's except exceptions. And if you're on the defensive, you're almost always in the right. Okay. Now, that's in the context, again, of just how just war theory would actually look at this situation and begin to make a moral judgment about the morality of the war. Now, overall, you might say war is wrong, all war is wrong. But that doesn't end them. I mean, they're still there, you know, and they're still going to happen. So the question is, what are the judgments that we make about it in terms of who's right, who's wrong? How do we help alleviate what's going on? And you know, what, do we, what do we say about that from a moral standpoint? So, okay. I, I, are we out of time? Yeah. 
Unfortunately, we are out of time, Dr. Lard. Yeah. Um, so those of you who still have questions, I'm so sorry. Um, but if it's okay with you, can you hang out for a little bit? And you're welcome to come and have conversation. Um, otherwise, please join us online and here at 1030 for our Choral Eucharist. And thank you so much for being here. And I have, I have one more oh. quick, yeah. <laughs> Uh, just as a, a quick announcement, our community corner this morning, uh, which usually highlights something happening within the ministry work at St. John's, this morning it is Faith in Action working with Together Colorado to engage your faith in a political way. So Together Colorado is asking for you to consider issues that are important to our Christian faith. They're issues that we've been talking about at our Dean's Forum for the last couple of weeks. So please stop by, check out their table, um, and consider the ways that you think about bringing issues into your voting and political life. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Dr. Lyle.